things like you can't be afraid of doing that. You just have to, you know, take a calculated risk and, and kind of jump in and make it work. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hey, this is Enoch, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture, the show for solo architects, where each week I bring you an interview exploring how you can leverage your skills as an architect to make more money so you can forget about paying the bills and focus on creating great architecture. I want to welcome everyone out to Business of Architecture today. Today we have Rob Paulus AIA with us. He's the principal and owner of Rob Paulus Architects. He's in Tucson, Arizona. Now, Rob is a strong advocate of infill development and sustainable design, and he's garnered numerous awards for and publications for his firm's work. Now, in addition to being an architect, Rob has also taken part in developing projects. Uh, one of his first projects was the Barrio Metallico. Another one was a 51 residential unit, the Ice House Lofts, that we're going to Rob is going to be telling us about today, where they reuse an existing 1920s ice factory. Now, both of these projects have been awarded Western Mountain Region AIA Awards. So congratulations for that, Rob, and welcome to the show. Yeah, it's great to be here, Enoch. Thanks. You bet. So first of all, Rob, tell us a little bit about sort of give us an overview of who your firm is, what you do, just so people can know and understand who you are if they haven't run across you before. Yeah, I I, uh, I went to the University of Arizona back in the 80s and then promptly left uh, Arizona to work out in Los Angeles, which was a great, great experience just to be exposed to mixed use projects. We uh the firm I worked for actually worked on the Back to the Future ride at Universal Studios. It was a really great mix, a lot of energy. We did some overseas projects. Uh, and then I moved back to Tucson because uh, actually, quite honestly, I missed the big blue sky. Once you once you fall in love with the desert, it's, it's kind of hard to leave. And it's kind of a joke amongst uh, Tucsonans that leave and they eventually come back for one reason or another. Uh, I worked for a firm for a year and a half and kind of got sick of working for the man and, and started out on my own uh, foolishly at first thinking that I could get all these bigger projects. But what it enabled me to do, though, is to jump into creating smaller residential and commercial projects where I had 100 percent control over the kind of design destiny within what I had control over. So then uh, it, it kind of jump started uh, much better what then developed into this kind of architect as developer role that we're currently in. But we still do work for other clientele. We've done some work for uh, higher education, and we have kind of a steady stream of uh, enlightened developers, private developers. So we're able to enact a lot of the design ideas and approach that we do for their own development. And a lot of these guys see the benefit of hiring someone who's done it before on their own to better their own projects. So. I can't complain. We've we've been we've kind of struggled the last three years or so, but things have picked up. Uh, my firm was up to ten people. Uh, we went down to three. Now we're back up to six. So it's really been fun. And and now we have, as I'll talk in the uh, later on, is just there's finally some other development projects happening here in the old pueblo. Yeah. Is looking back on those early days, Rob, is there anything you would do differently? Uh, I would do everything different. It's uh, it's funny the, the what you can learn from a negative experience is pretty amazing. Uh, that I would probably go to work if I had it all to do over again. I'd jump in and work for an established design firm. But the reality is, it's interesting because having worked for uh, kind of smaller firms, it's kind of made me more aware of how to be a developer, to be an architect as a developer. So. Uh, I encourage any young architect to kind of get out of their uh, kind of safe swimming hole and you know jump into the big pond or ocean wherever that may be. Okay. It really helps. So tell me, let's go back in time and tell me a little bit about the time when you transitioned from working. You graduated from school, went out, started working for other firms, and then what was that key moment? Tell me about that transition from going from being an employee to charting your own path and getting out there and working yeah. for yourself. Well, what's interesting is. Uh, is I didn't even think I wanted to do this. It, it kind of fell in our lap. We I had been working with a client who uh, was kind of new to development. He'd done a lot of flips, and he saw our design ability, and we did a couple very successful projects in a historic area here in Tucson, the Barrio. And from that, uh, this particular client uh, found the Ice House building uh, 
And at first thought he would just flip it, but then he talked uh, with me and literally within a day, we had put a development team together of another friend of mine who was from Boston. Uh, the other guy, first guy I mentioned was from Chicago. So it was really this synergistic, like, wow, there's this great building. It's selling for $15 a square foot. It's from 1923, has this incredible vocabulary of materials and space. Uh, and, and even the kind of scary parts of the building, we always talk about, there was one area, and it's an ice and cold storage building from 1923 that had been abandoned. Uh, but there's one part where it's these old steel windows and they're half broken and literally there's pigeons flying around and the light's streaming in. It's almost like a Martin Scorsese film, but that kind of scariness appealed to someone who we all have lived in urban environments. Uh, and we knew that this building could be repositioned fairly easily uh, just in terms of the thought pattern, like attracting early adopters to kind of an off the beaten path area, but it had such authenticity right next to the railroad tracks. Um, we had two weeks for due diligence to just kind of figure out, put a letter of intent in, see if it was gonna work. And somehow we, you know, four basic uh, kind of components of the partnership said yes, and we made it work. It was, wow, uh, wow. I like, I like, Rob, how you say, you know, most people would say railroad track equals noise. You say railroad track equals authenticity. Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, it, we we talk about that. Like, uh, there's a incredible guy, Seth Godin, who uh, he's a marketeer. Has wrote some great books. But the idea that, uh, especially as uh, an architect, and we always talk about whether it's Jonathan Siegel or some of the great stuff West or East Coast, it takes someone who has uh, emotional attachment to either a building or a location or an area. Because uh, one thing that really describes kind of what we do, we always talk about the project and. We're currently working on some uh, projects that are in a historic neighborhood. So rather, we, we ask questions first rather than uh, kind of coming in with a concept. But it's really critical because we talk about project and you can instantly tell someone who is interested in design versus just making money because they talk about the deal. And so we're really proud of how we embrace, which I find very attractive is you don't want to leave any stone unturned. Uh, which includes even the naysayers. Like if we can turn someone around and have them actually find out that they're on the same ground as we are in development, it just makes it that much more rich. So. And when, when, they, when they use that sort of phraseology, the deal, kind of what does that represent in your mind that they're talking about? It's just, you know, how can we create a cash cow? <laughs> it's, okay. And, and get in fast and leave as quick as possible. You know, if it's a lease product, they want to lease it out real quick, which, you know, a lot of these investments are based on kind of the lease rate, not so much the actual uh, building. So, and that's happened here locally quite a bit with student housing, where they, you know, in, in essence, kind of triple their investment in a matter of a year and a half. So, well, which is good. I mean, there's people that just want to do that, but we take a, a definitely a different approach. Sounds like a more holistic approach to the environment. We think so. I think, you know, there, we always talk about, you know, when you do, uh, my wife is in branding and she was a big, Randy Dorman, uh, I met her in Manhattan, uh, which is something I also had to do just to meet my wife. I had to go out of town, so I <laughs> get out of the small town. Uh, but we, we talk about, uh, you know, what, what creates uh, a great synergy and what allows something to be successful. And it's, it comes from a lot of different angles, so. Definitely, it's obviously a lot more work to do what we do, but it's very, very gratifying at the end sure, of the day. Sure, sure. So when, when you're talking about different angles that make a successful project, what sort of other things are you looking at besides the ledger sheet or the, the profit and loss statement? Uh, we want something that, uh, thanks for bringing me back on track, but we want a project that will be around for 50 years, another 100 years. Our ice house, when we purchased it, was an 80-year-old building and we essentially gave it another 50 to 100 years or even longer potentially. And th that's what really differentiates is to be able to come back uh, in a decade and say, I did that project, it still looks good and people appreciate it. Because that's one thing in America, especially in the Western cities, you go to, you, know, you travel through Europe and things have been there in some cases thousands of years and there's almost like a social uh, consciousness of, of design. Like people don't accept crap. And unfortunately in the West, which is even in big cities like San Francisco and LA and San Diego, there's, 
you can definitely see the marginal projects where someone just wasn't enlightened or didn't want to give back to the community. Even as simple as, you know, picking the right color or wall material. It's, you know, we, we want to create something that's going to live longer than we do, we are. Awesome. And I think as architects, we tend to, to think that way because of our training, I find. But Rob, so going back, so we're talking about the Ice House Lofts right now. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful building. And those of you watching this video, you'll be able to see the images that we're, we're going to splice into the video showing this project. Uh, pretty, pretty remarkable factory building, beautiful brick facades. And so let's take me back sort of step by step through that process when the person knocked on the door. Uh, how did that process go? Who were they? How did they know about you? Uh, well, it was one of my clients who we'd done some work together and, and uh, he told me about the building and we walked through it. That same day I called, it was just like, this is a huge, it, it was a uh, 36,000 square feet and it's all abandoned, this kind of scary space. Some of the height of the building was 40 feet high wow. and uh, half the building was cold storage. So there's literally no windows, but there had been little pinholes and cracks in the concrete. So it really had this incredible uh, kind of psychological effect, just walking through the building. So we uh, literally within a day, we put a team together. We didn't know what we were going to do, but we all walked through the building and said, hey, there's something here. Um, you know, we could offer, you know, buy this substantial building for 15 bucks a square foot. We actually figured out it was on 2.6 acres of land, so the land cost was less than five bucks a square foot. So uh, it made sense to take a risk, and we had enough people we could just throw cash down to purchase the building, which I think was very, it was just a, the right, the timing was perfect to jump into this thing. It was in uh, the summer of 2002, and things were heating up, you know, so we took a risk and then did our due diligence and figured out we could uh, create living and, and and I want to emphasize like within Tucson uh, the rates you can get for rentals you just can't afford to do it like what Jonathan's doing in San Diego is incredible but you can't use that same model of just building and leasing here because the lease rates are so low we don't have the job base as uh, some of the coastal cities so it had to be a condominium project and it, it worked out perfect we sold out three years later in the summer of 2005 which you know, if you look at the charts of how the real estate market went, it was at the peak. So everything worked out good. And I still live there. My, my wife and our nine-year-old daughter are still there eight years later. And it's a really great community. And a lot of it is just when you do a really cool project, that's you, you attract that early adopter, which is what I like to think I am. And you, it's almost like a like-minded, not so much demographic, but psychographic that kind of that wants to be in these kind of cool spaces. So, and even in the new stuff we create, we really rely on some of the lessons we learned from working with older buildings where the proportions are different, the heights are different. Sometimes you have a, a room that's squeezed, but uh, to, to create something that's not a track home uh, uh, paradigm is yeah. all about. Absolutely. Very, very interesting, Rob. Now, one thing that you mentioned was talking about the condos as opposed to a for lease project. And... I've just heard that, and I know condo developments are always sometimes litigious. Was there any worry about lawsuits with the sort of condo model? Yeah, I mean, you have to obviously get the proper insurance. Uh, what I've learned is instead of being the architect where you entrust the contractor, and we didn't build this project, we had a contractor. Uh, architects, honestly, if they're doing these higher risk projects, they need to completely be embedded in the construction process and take a greater control even if they're just doing construction administration because it's all about the details and it certainly helps to do a couple projects to know what those critical uh, details are which really comes down to keeping water out and also keeping sound from migrating so uh, yeah you, even when you're doing something modern and contemporary you really want to have those details put together so someone can come back and say it's leaking and we actually had some uh, uh, with we always attribute it to when the project was built, which is uh, 2004. We, in some cases, we got the B or C crew, so we had some issues with uh, water and windows. You have some big, tall, you know, double height windows, uh, and and by going through that, we were able to fix everything. And everyone, you know, we finally got the window guy to accept what he did wrong. But those hard learned lessons, uh, 
if, if you get through them and you work really hard, we're very uh, big on just attacking anything that might be difficult, it, no matter what it is, whether working with a client or our own development, is just attack it head on. As you learn from it, people, you know, it goes away, if there's any issues, but uh, in the long run, you then have that experience to know that you can push harder next time, whether it's a detail or a, mm. you, going after zoning. Like we now know that we've had a number of things rezoned and, you know, setbacks reduced. You know, it's amazing what if you go in with the right uh, kind of uh, heart and soul and obviously intellect, you can uh, do a lot more. You can push the envelope. And it's all about just constantly, you know, you want to do better on the next project. The next project's always the best one. <laughs> awesome. And we're going to get to that later, right? Yeah. The next projects. <laughs> now, you talk about pushing the envelope with zoning and sort of a certain mindset that you need to have to go in there. What does that mindset look like when you're standing there in front of the planning commission or trying to make these changes? Sort of how do you attack these these problems? Yeah, well, one thing we really have learned is uh, is to get everyone on the same page and explain to them literally ask questions where they then explain back to you, whether it's a neighborhood group or the uh, planning commissioner is, is just, I mean, to me, there's just basic, basic uh, qualities that everyone can agree on, whether it's natural light or uh, in Tucson, we have a modern streetcar coming in. So there's a lot of talk about density. What's the proper density? Uh, it's, it's, it's about creating uh, a vision that is, that everyone can share. So whether it's, if it's planning commission, it's really what, it's much like, you know, any good athlete will tell you that the race is won during the training. So we like to say, you really have to spend that time up front. So when you're, there's no question, you kind of get everybody on board before they're voting on, say, a, a rezoning. So it really is, uh, and we as architects, we have, unlike any other field, we have this incredible ability to, whether it's to take information and put it in a graphic format or just explain a concept in a really simple way. With uh, you know whether it's models or three dimensional uh, drawings with a computer, it's 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 pretty uh, it's enticing to. In some ways, it's like it's like a, you create this magic of how you express what the idea is and let other people buy into it. So, I wish I could show you some of those examples. We've been actually doing a lot of planning strategies by using physical models, where it's color coded. Uh, we've done this with some of our university projects, but even with neighborhoods is you create a sandbox of a model that people can literally move pieces around and there's color coded coded objects and that way they we always talk about if you can have someone physically touch something even if you're just presenting a model then they can buy into it more we, we just presented a concept it's not our own development but it's a substantial project 180 living units and we created this model that people could touch and it was so gratifying we have a picture of like three of the of the clients are actually touching the model. It's just a very visceral sensation where they become part of the process. And these are these sort of like building blocks that they can stack into a building or are they disparate elements that they move around on the site? Uh, it's, it's typically, if it's a highly uh, complicated program, we color code and then let people play with it. Like, uh, you know, the, the, we did a, a project for integrative medicine here in Tucson and started doing this process, but it was a clinic, it was an auditorium, it was office space. and Within 10 minutes, they had arranged these blocks in like three different really cool schemes. We took photos and we kind of talked them through advantages, disadvantages. It was a very compelling way to just work with uh, kind of these disparate groups. Which, very uh, interesting. We're really looking forward to this one project, which we finally have cooking now, which you mentioned earlier, is uh, we're looking forward to using those kind of tools to work with the neighborhood, which will be very yeah. exciting. Interesting. Well, it's, what I find interesting about that, Rob, is I mean how the sales process and the collaborative process and the design process are sort of all intermeshed because it seems that when you get people on board, they're more likely down the road to be willing to accept or help out. You know, if something goes south or something doesn't work out the way they wanted, then they were part of the process and so they have that sense of ownership, I guess. Yeah, they do. Yeah, and quite honestly, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, you can, as a single entity or even as a designer, you're going to look at things different. Uh, probably more so on kind of what it, the object becomes, but it's really when you're in a neighborhood and someone's lived there for 30, 40 years, or in the case of one guy, uh, his grandparents built the house in the historic area. So 
they have a whole different viewpoint and if you listen to them it can enrich the design process it's even if they come from a completely you know they they want something historic but you want to do something modern which is what we do but you can end up on the same page if, if the conversation is proper and there's a clear avenue of communication interesting interesting so so we talked about the borrow Okay, we haven't talked about the Bar Metallica, but we just finished talking about the Ice House Lofts. Oh, yeah. and one, one thing I wanted to ask about about the Ice House Lofts, Rob, was the, the way that that deal was structured. So the first um, investor, the first client, he was, you said he was a previous client, he came in and he was looking at this product that was for sale. Is that right? Oh, uh, the Ice House. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, you know, basically kind of an uh, empty building that was for mm -hmm. sale, and it was too big for him to take on, so... He talked to me and we put together basically three investors that were also part of the development team. So within that, okay. I was the architect. Uh, Warren was uh, a broker and really good at land deals. And then uh, a friend of mine, Phil Littman, was in real estate and development. We'd done some work with him too. Uh, so, uh, And then my wife, Randy Dorman, came in. Who then she got her real estate license and... She uh, worked for Interbrand, one of the largest branding uh, companies in the world in Manhattan. So it was everything was un under one kind of umbrella for a fairly substantial project. It's you know 51 living units. It, the project was 76,000 square feet by the time we added all the different levels. So we you know design, branding, marketing, real estate. We we did everything, including opening up our own sales office and. Uh, that way people could come in and look at models and kind of figure out which unit they would want to purchase. Because that was another thing with the for sale product. It's a, you know, here it makes more sense, although we are transitioning into more of a lease type project. But at the time, condo made complete sense. But the, to get it financed, and also it, it took incredible effort to first find someone who'd want to build it for us, as well as to find a bank who would finance it. We went through, you know, one after the other and finally ended up with a contractor and a bank that saw what we could do, but we had to have 50% uh, reservations to get the loan. And those are kind of locked in reservations. So it took a ton of work to get, assemble all that and then move forward with the project. But wow. And your, your equity stake in the project, Rob, was it your, your design services? It actually wasn't. And uh, it was actually, my wife and I were a third investor. So okay. it was, we purchased the property and then we're able to get, you know, did a lot of the sweat equity up front to get it to work. Um, and then we were able to uh, pull some development fee once the loan was, was put in place. Okay. So, so you were some, actually able to put in personal funds into the project. Yeah. Yeah. It, which was really mm -hmm. just the acquisition and then the initial, you know, like some of the, uh, you know, engineering, I got paid a little bit up front too, to get the design happening, but it then came out of the loan, which is something to talk about too with these projects is there's a way to get funding for whether you're doing a smaller project as an architect or you have a team, you're doing larger things, is you can pull money out of the loan for development fees. So that it just helps you push, get through before you finally finish the project or you're selling or leasing. So it's, okay. it's helpful. What, what pointers or advice would you give to other architects that would like to develop their own projects about how to get started? You know, that's a tough one because, as I said, this kind of fell into my lap. Um, it's, I would, if you're in a, a larger area, uh, obviously, if, if, if there's other architects who are doing it, they can certainly help you. Uh, I know they've got the uh, different types of uh, teaching and school in, in San Diego where you can kind of go take a class. Even here at the University of Arizona, they're starting a program not architect as developer, but just at talking about development where they've got multiple people that come in and uh, talk about what they do and how they do it. Uh, but I would think, even though the project we did was substantial, it was 51 units, but I would think you could start small. And that's where, it's a nice segue into the Barrio Metallico project. So you can imagine we've got this old warehouse, we're converting it. We know it's gonna take you know two or three years to do the project. So what we did is we went around the neighborhood and literally across the street, there was empty lots that we, uh, it took some effort. They weren't like they were a for sale sign out front, but we contacted the owners and were able to convince them to sell property. So it kind of was, uh, that was our small project because it was nine 
freestanding homes. There's two different properties we subdivided and we purposely said, you know, that we need to create something edgy that creates a precedent for the neighborhood that shows that kind of loft and modern living will work. Uh, more so from our marketing point of view, because we already had our funding in place for the ice house. Uh, so we purchased land at a fairly low price. Uh, one of the projects, hopefully you've got some of the images we can show, but we kept some of the old adobe walls, which is really fascinating to me to have kind of bright and shiny, new, modern, but next to material that's in some cases 100 years old. So it was re respecting the neighborhood a bit while also interjecting with something new. But each of these units, it was just a... a Kind of a two bedroom two bath loft just a wedge literally it was a metal building frame that we put in and we over insulated we got a the local utility company gave us a guarantee for the like their energy audit it just worked out well and did passive solar we had that's one thing we do a lot of is we pre-plumb and pre-wire for solar because some of the incentives don't allow us to put it in but if you put that in and you position it it's another yet another marketing tool that people will respond to Gotcha. Um, so the first unit, it's interesting because we built those, it's kind of crazy, for about 80 bucks a square foot because it was just so trimmed back. It's literally just a highly insulated frame, some windows that are in the right proportion, uh, some nice volume. Even we're really big on using, uh, it's kind of a almost like a test. If it, What can you do with a $2 industrial light fixture? So we now even end up using those on some of these million dollar projects we use. But we were able to put this together where the first unit sold, I think, for 185000 And it's about uh, almost 1,600 square feet. And the last one sold for uh, over three hundred. So it was really a, kind of a pivotal point for us primarily saying this is really going to work. So that was a yeah. small project to get the thing moving. That's, that's huge. And, Rob, when you said you, you bought the land, oh, who are you talking about? Who bought the land and where did the money come from to buy the land for the – well, Metallica. That was yet another one. That was uh, cash to get the land. I think that's critical. I mean, every every deal that we've done, I think unless you're in an urban center where you can spend a lot of money and know you're going to get it back out, but here in the West, it's all based on what the cost of the land is. And hopefully over, as our modern streetcar goes in and there's more infill, more density, that'll change. But so it, it was yet another, it was a cash, not a lot of money though to, to create yeah. the, was it, that was that cash of you and your wife that purchased that, or did you have other people? It's in our partnership, so it was uh, we were yet a third, and then the other two partners had their other. Okay. Thing. So okay. So, so from from the time that you had your own firm to the time you developed the Ice House Lofts, what kind of time span are we talking there? I started my firm in '95, and like I mentioned, we did a lot of really cool boutique projects, won a lot of awards here and there, uh, but it wasn't until 2002. So. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting up in eight. I'm, I'm pushing fifty. Seven. <laughs> well, that's, so that's <laughs> well, that's about that's about seven years. And I guess where I'm going with the question, Rob, is you can feel free not to answer this if you don't want. But I'm just I'm just wondering how you accrued the capital to do that. Um, uh, you know, being a um, having your own firm sometimes is, is difficult for people. So I'm just wondering if your business was doing that well that you were able to put away those funds. Yeah. Uh, give us an idea. I had a little, but honestly, uh, it was the collective effort of the group. Uh, it, it, it's it's you know if there's a if there's seed money there it's so much easier mm -hmm. to make it happen and whether you have it yourself within your immediate family uh, we now know and it's it's kind of catch twenty two because now we have people that that kind of approach us and potentially want to invest in projects but it's only because we've done them and there and there lies the problem like if if we didn't have these other two entities myself and my wife we wouldn't I wouldn't be developing unfortunately that's the that's the truth so. It's about yeah. that first thing. But with that said, is what we did at the Ice House, it was in a neighborhood that no one else was crazy enough to take a project like that on. But because the price of the lot and the building were low, and then the adjacent property, Barrio Metallica, was uh, very inexpensive. And we had the toolkit to know we could come in, subdivide these lots, do a cool design. And every architect has that ability to know how to work the zoning, create something interesting. Did you have to rezone the Barrio Metallico? We did not. Actually, we found kind of a loophole where it was zoned commercially, and commercial zoning doesn't have a minimum lot size, but you can also, within the Tucson zoning, you can build residential in a commercial zone. So we were able to do kind of substandard lot sizes. It was almost like what the, what's happening in L.A. with the smaller uh, lot requirement. So... 
and, and that's something too is really I, I think to know how to work the zoning code I mean you're still within compliance but there's always there always seems to be ways whether it's a, a variance or modification or really just looking at how do you put residential into commercial and that worked out really well for us but that's I would think if someone didn't have their own capital, that's obviously a key uh, skill set to really be uh, up on. Is how do you how do you how do you increase density, and then how do you go into neighborhoods that typically you wouldn't build something um, of a modern nature and transform it? So it, we we really lucked out because this neighborhood it, it was an old industrial area, but it was cut up by the railroad by uh, an underpass, and it was kind of atrophying as industrial and we saw the ability to transform it so that's key too really uh you know to be an architect you have to be uh, ever uh you always have to be an optimist and that's definitely a quality that that as architects we can employ to do these kind of projects <laughs> you have to have that positive attitude right yeah. yeah so so rob that's before we transition into our second segment before we end the first segment here just wanted to go back really quickly um, and get a little bit more information about how you started your own firm. You moved from LA and you worked for a firm in Tucson, or did you just go to Tucson and just start oh, doing I, your own yeah, thing? Yeah, so I worked for the medium-sized firm uh, in LA. Came back here and worked for uh, like a twenty-person firm. And mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting because I just went to the uh, uh, AIA convention in Denver and ran into two buddies that we all work together. And one guy is highly successful at Smith Group. The other guy is. Uh, with uh, UNLV, he's uh, like the design director there. We were joking, like these, the, our immediate bosses didn't see the talent in the room, but we all knew it. So that's what convinced me to kind of go out on my own. And I was very content for a number of years doing small projects, kind of little boutique. The reality is, is uh, I talk about this a lot. There, like even when I met my wife in New York, it's kind of serendipitous that I was there to. Uh, hang out with my buddies and architect and then three days into it I meet my you know what would be my wife at a dinner party and wow. you really have to seize those opportunities and I think if you're just kind of thinking you're an architect and you're going to draw something up for a client you won't see that like it's amazing having done development work uh, even with some of our clients we can either give them advice or potentially say we could be part of your development team as you look at this project so yeah we've done recently too uh, with some of our smaller projects, we we're building them for our clients because we say, "Oh wow, we're, we're you know we've done three different uh, house projects like that." And the reality is, is we spend probably about the same amount of time building it, maybe a little bit more because we need someone out on the out in the field. Uh, but otherwise, everything we do is so custom. You we save time because we're not re-educating the the yeah. builder. So yeah, it's fascinating. Yet another way, especially for a younger like I, pretty much built the first project uh, it was an owner build but then I kind of stepped in and became the guy getting all the subs to show up and really do a clean product so that in and of itself was a great uh, learning lesson like to go bigger firm and then you're doing your first project and you end up helping to build it so it's, it, once again things like you can't be afraid of doing that you just have to you know take a calculated risk and and kind of jump in and make it work I think that's a good place to end the, the interview. Okay. Rob, so thanks. Thanks for joining us on Business of Architecture. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Okay. Take... All right. Well, that puts the lid on another show about the business of architecture. I really hope that you got something out of this show that can help you have more success and profit in the world of architecture. And if you want to join the discussion about this episode, you can find it on the podcast page on businessofarchitecture.com. And while you're there, feel free to share the show using the social media share links. If you sign up for the Business of Architecture Insider List, I'll send you other resources like the Architect Marketing Guide and information on how to use web tools to get more visibility for your firm and your work. expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts and I make no representation guarantee promise agreement affirmation pledge warranty contract bond commitment except to help architects conquer the world bump music credit to Ben Folds 5 do it anyway